Good afternoon and welcome to our program this afternoon, hosted by the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at New England Historic Genealogical Society. My name is Rachel King and I'm the Executive Director of the Jewish Heritage Center, which is a destination for exploring and preserving the history of Jewish families and institutions in New England and beyond. We are an archive, educational center, and family history resource located at New England Historic Genealogical Society, America's founding genealogical organization. Today, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Bernice Lerner, who will be speaking about her new book, All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, A British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen-Belsen. She will also be in discussion with moderator Ryan Woods about biography as a window into ethics and character. Before we begin, I just wanna make a few notes about this webinar. Uh, you in the audience will be muted throughout. If you have questions during uh, Bernice's presentation, please type them into the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen and we will try to answer as many as possible following the presentation and the conversation. Please note also that we are all broadcasting from our homes today. So bear with us if we experience any technological issues or if there are stray sounds. Um, even if we do lose the connection or if something happens on your end, you will have access to the full recording of this session afterward. Now I am so pleased to introduce both our guest speaker and our moderator today. First, Dr. Bernice Lerner is a senior scholar at Boston University's Center for Character and Social Responsibility. She is a former Dean of Adult Learning at Hebrew College. She's taught several courses related to the Holocaust and character and is also author of three books including The Triumph of Wounded Souls, Seven Holocaust Survivors' Lives. Bernice earned a bachelor's degree from Stony Brook University, a master's from the Jewish Theological Seminary, and a doctorate from Boston University. Following her discussion of the book, Bernice will be in conversation with our moderator, Ryan Woods, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. Ryan is a very thoughtful interviewer, but he also joins the program today as a former student of Bernice Learners, having done his graduate work at Boston University's Center for Character and Social Responsibility, where his focus was on developing character education curricula at museums through teaching biography. We look forward to Bernice and Ryan's conversation at the end of which they will answer your questions. So please join me in welcoming Bernice Lerner. Can you see me? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, thank you very much. First of all, thank you, Rachel, for that generous and kind introduction. And thank you to the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at the New England Historic Genealogical Society for inviting me. And this is going to be a bit of a different sort of um, author's talk because uh, Ryan Woods has really inspired me. He was my former student and he inspired me to talk about this, this uh, task of writing this book through the lens of character and ethics. So I'm just going to start off with a quote by one of my mentors. Uh, History, whether personal or collective, is the best guide to our individual and collective lives. We need always to compute who or which action in self or others deserves praise and which deserts principle and deserves criticism and condemnation. And I like this quote a lot, but I want to say that we are going to enter in this presentation, the world of the extreme. So we're going to talk about character. We're going to talk, talk about the lessons and the guide of the, the guide that is given to us by the protagonist, because looking at how they lived and how they navigated extreme circumstances is helpful. The extreme sheds light on the ordinary. 
but we will come to a point where there will be a limit, which I will explain to you. Next slide. So um, the book I wrote is All the Horrors of War that I am just showing you two images here because it's just interesting that I supplied. It was published simultaneously in the UK and the US. Both publishers had the same images to work with. It came up with different titles and book covers. But I wanted you to see the UK version, which has like my mom, uh, who is one of the protagonists of the book. She is 16 years old in this picture. Her name is Re Rachel Guinoth uh, here. And um, she is in a tuberculosis sanitarium. I wanted just you to see her full standing in snowy Northwest Sweden. And you can see that she's well nourished by this point, but there's a real sad look in her eyes. It's not like sometimes you would see maybe pictures of survivors who are smiling or happy, or maybe they're in their twenties or older or rebuilding their lives. Here she is orphaned. Everyone in her family was murdered except her and her older sister. They barely survived. And she's very, very sick in this picture. And it's a few months after the war, like six months after the war. Above that, you see Glenn Hughes on the British version that's above. And he is in his caravan in the vicinity of Bergen-Belsen working out how he's going to uh, rescue these people. He was a very planned out medical military officer here. He is deputy director of medical services for the entire British second army. And you can see sort of the serious look in his eyes. And it looks also like he's caught by the cameraman. But um, my website has more pictures of him. But anyway, next slide. So childhood matters, right, in character and the development of character. I don't go really deep into the childhood of my two protagonists, the rescuer and the one who was saved. But I do have some flashbacks in the book that give you a little window into how their character might have been formed. And Glenn Hughes is a very, I was very taken with him uh, his, when I started to learn about him. He's most prominently associated with the uh, liberation of Bergen-Belsen. He was an unintended liberator. It was totally a surprise to him. It wasn't what he had planned on, but he acted with great compassion and uh, was a real hero to the survivors. So I wanted to sort of explore who he was. And it turns out that he had his own sort of experience of liberation as a child. I don't have really early pictures of him, but he was diagnosed when he was very little, maybe five or six years old, as having a spinal deformity and told by, his mother was told by doctors that he would be forever puny. Um, and he had to be wheeled around in a spinal carriage. So you can imagine a five, six, seven year old having to be wheeled around in something like that's what they looked at like the, uh, at the time, he couldn't walk. He was really had a, a disability. And then when he was about 10, 11 years old, he and his mother enrolled him in a school for sons of medical men. He actually lost his father when he was just two years old. And that also had a big bearing on his life and his view of sacrifice uh, in the line of duty. But anyway, here he is and he becomes, he's enrolled in this college called Epsom College, which was a public school which in England, which would probably be akin to a private school here. And he had this meteoric rise. He had this sort of liberation from being a crippled young child to being um, an athlete. And there's a picture on the bottom of him post-World War I where he is, he is very active rugby player. And yeah, he, he was one of the father figures of rugby football in England. So he was a superstar athlete. So he had his own story of liberation. Next slide. And my mom, her childhood is, I was really hard to, um, hard to figure out. It took me a while because um, we have not a single photograph of her or anyone in her family. Um, from before the war. We, I don't know what my grandparents look like. And uh, she, I've mined her mind because she was only 14 years old when she last saw her parents and her family. So I've really asked her questions throughout my life about her growing up in this place called Siget, which 
I visited before the pandemic and I was so glad I did because the mountains haven't moved. It Siget is a, a word for island in Hungarian and it is surrounded, it's a little island town surrounded by mountains. It was a beautiful place to grow up and sort of be this free range kid who was roaming all around this town, which was located in Transylvania. And um, you could see near the border of Czechoslovakia and near the Ukraine. So um, Ellie Wiesel was actually her neighbor. Uh, he lived just two minutes away. And uh, that was kind of interesting. I always like to hear him talk about his town. Next slide. So when you look at, when you're looking um, at your protagonists, and this was something that I did sort of subconsciously because I always have character in the back of my mind, but there are questions you can ask of them. Um, and there's no one who's not flawed, uh, not my mom, not Glenn Hughes, nobody who doesn't have their weak points, but we're, you know, we can ask where in their, in their trajectory, where in their travels, do we see the presence or absence of wisdom, seeing the right thing to do, justice, aiming at doing the right thing, courage, the way they deal with external challenges and temperance, how do they deal with what's going on inside them, their internal challenges. And here were people who were navigating the horrors of war. And I, and I have to say that as I trace their journeys over the last year of the war, which is the most dramatic year, and I have to say that they exhibited these virtues in spades. So they are stories that we would want to carry with us. They would want to be, you would want these among your repertoire of stories that you would carry when faced with a difficult situation in your life. How do people cope? How do they display these wisdom, justice, courage? And it's kind of instructive. Next slide, please. So I did trace their journeys um, from the East and from the West. My mom, if you look on the bottom right of this map, is in, she was from Siget and everything happened really rapid fire fast in her life uh, in terms of being deported. The Hungarian Jews were the last to be murdered en masse in Auschwitz. Uh, the Polish Jews suffered much longer in ghettos. And of course they were taken to the death camps of Maidanek, Treblinka, Auschwitz, Chelmno, but the Hungarian Jews, there was the last mass of Jews and left in Europe and they had been protected until the Nazis marched in in March of 1944. And my mother was only in the ghetto for a few weeks when they were taken away and taken on this cattle wagon uh, horror ride to Auschwitz. And then I talk about in the book how my mother escapes from, doesn't escape, but she is selected eventually after two months in Auschwitz to leave, which was a miracle because she had already been slated for the gas chamber on several occasions. How she's taken to this labor camp called Christianstadt, what is going on then when they are evacuated uh, at the end, uh, at the end of January 1945, beginning of February, they're put on a death march and then taken again in the cattle wagon to this Bergen Belsen, which was a dumping ground. It was the largest concentration camp in 1945, and here the Nazis brought in all these people who had evaded the gas chambers, survived slave labor survived the death march. The young and the strong were deposited here and they were dying by the thousands in Bergen-Belsen. And I traced the opposite journey. I juxtaposed the story with the journey of Glenn Hughes. Who was this man? And what was his role in the rescue? Well, I take, you know, I take him from the Yorkshire, Yorkshire Walds where he's uh, training with the, his eighth corps with all the medical men. And he is in charge of of the medical rescue, um, finding hospitals, uh, how are they going to evacuate wounded soldiers? How are they gonna treat them? And he's involved with the D-Day invasion, crossing over the English Channel. And then where is he as he's going through as the British uh, and the allies are fighting their battles all the way up through France and Belgium and, cross and the Netherlands and then crossing finally the fortress of Germany. And Glenn Hughes was a man who was all about preparedness and planning. And then he 
uh, a very unusual truce happens and the British Second Army is told that they're going to be taking over this concentration camp where there were 1500 typhus cases. And of course that wasn't the case. He found 55 to 60,000 starved and emaciated and dying human beings. Next slide. So this is just um, the kind, just, I was just very taken with Glenn Hughes's handwriting and I, in my research, I combed through volumes and volumes of his notes, but this just is a, char a chart of how they estimate the number of casualties. Uh, you see all the way on the left, D plus one, D plus two, that's D day plus two days, D day plus three days, and how everything is done to a science. Next slide and how they're gonna evacuate them and the special units that are needed, the neurosurgical units, maxillofacial units and teams and everything down to exactly how many minutes surgery would take practically down to the second for various things. And this was his role. This was his, he had to figure out transportation. He had to locate hospitals and coordinate the whole thing, work with assistant directors of medical services of different parts of the army. Next slide. And my mother, meanwhile, is going through uh, her travails and her, her wartime journey until the point at which the two protagonists converge, which is on April 15th, 1945. My mom had already been in Bergen-Belsen for a month. Every second was like an eternity. It was a real hell. There was no more uh, late slave labor. There were no more um, really standing for upheld, which was a form of torture standing to be counted. It was just a real dumping ground and there were no really adequate housing facilities. It was continually, transports were being dumped there. There was barely any food, no medicine, no habitable, habitable place to, no lavatories, it was just an awful place. And you see on the uh, left, there's a sign, danger typhus. This was part of the truce. There had to be signs erected everywhere as the British units are coming in to bergen -Bilsen. And it was the most photographed and filmed of any anything during the war or right after the war. This was actually took place, April 15th was three weeks before the end of World War II. Um, had the British come in just two, three days later, my mother would not have survived. I wouldn't be here. She wouldn't be here. My children, you know, and too many lives were lost. It just took too long to, to make it. But um, they did manage to save about 14,000, 15,000 people. But um, anyway, so here's the British coming in. And on the bottom right, you see what the camp looked like. There was... Um, three compounds on the left and two on the right. There was a, a dirt road bisecting them. And in the days before, like April 12th, uh, um, when the Germans knew that the British would be coming in, they um, had the inmates who could still walk, who were like 50% dead, drag the skeletal skeletons, some who were just 90% dead to these mass graves in an effort to clean up the camp and because there were just piles of corpses everywhere. And I really tremble showing you these slides, but I can, I just wanted to show you, get a little sense. My mom was one of the ones who was pressed into service. And of course this had to stop, this using the inmates to bury the dead had to stop very quickly because they were dying themselves on the road. Next slide. So here on the, on the, um, Top left, the um, British pressed the German, uh, there was about 800 um, ver uh, SS soldiers who remained in the camp to keep order and they pressed them into service. I'm not sure I got that number right, but anyway, um, they, whoever remained, there were some, some German SS had to stay for the transition. They had to bury the dead. And in the bottom left, you see Rabbi Leslie Hardman, the, Jewish chaplain with the second British Second Army, who's just uh, so mournful of the way people are being buried, helter skelter, skelter in these mass pits, and he is just heartbroken. And it was a terrible emergency situation. It couldn't be helped because of the danger and risk of the outbreak of cholera. On the upper right, you see a girl with a uh, square cut out of her back of her coat. Um, this 
happened everywhere because they wanted any inmate who tried to escape to be easily identifiable. So they did that. And then on the bottom, the, the British, uh, three days after they came in, they pitched tents to get to evacuate the overcrowded huts. Anyone who could still walk or move could be moved into a tent and they could more easily get nourishment to the people inside the, inside the huts, get them a sip of water or whatever. Next slide. So um, here um, is a scene maybe in the upper left, similar to something my mom experienced where they got a little, they had to run and dig out spuds of potatoes while being shot at by Hungarian guards who were left in charge after the liberation for a couple of days until the British could get organized. And here's some women who are well enough who are cooking this cooking and and that was the atmosphere there in the back. There's just people who had died. And the bottom is also a picture of the camp. And next slide. So this is um, sig very significant to me, the tents and the huts. It doesn't look like much from this picture, but my mom was um, one of the ones who could still walk a little bit. So she was put in a tent with four other girls, but she was too sick and too weak by this point, and um, she was not able to close the flap door of the tent um, when it was her turn to do so. So basically she was told she had to leave. And when she went back to the hut, she was severely beaten up by her fellow inmates. And this happened several days after the liberation. So what happened on the ground, people don't think of, they think a liberation, uh, everyone cheers the liberators and they run to them. And that's not exactly how it went. It was a real process. And my mother would not blame. She would never say anything negative or bad about the people who, her own compatriots who beat her up because she said by that point, we were only animals. And this gets to the point of where we cannot really examine character when we are this far gone and when people are reduced to this kind of existence. Next slide. Doesn't really say this is, people are acting out of character. So here's a couple of side slides showing the rescue, how the British had to do it, factory style, triage style, going into the huts, marking those who had a chance of life, who could still breathe and evacuating them to a makeshift hospital. Now, of course, there was a lot of mistakes made in this triage. They left some people for dead who could have, who might have survived had they been evacuated. They evacuated some who died. My mom was on the borderline and she was, um, she was um, taken to a place where they didn't expect people to live. And she was actually in a room where um, there were 12 people, 12 women, and every day, they took out 11 dead and brought in 11 nearly dead. And for three weeks, she hung on. Um, the bottom, the top shows you the men wearing their protective gear. Um, they put the people in contaminated amb ambulances. They were, all were, had typhus. And after they went through the human laundry, they dubbed it the human laundry on the bottom right, um, where they a lot of German nurses were pressed into service because of the lack of people power to help. Um, they washed the inmates, they're just skeletals, skeletons, most of them, just skin and bones, and they sprayed them with DDT. And my mom went through this process and then they took them to a clean room and put them into clean ambulances and wrapped them with clean blankets. Next slide. So here's just a, uh, some approximate numbers and I'm only gonna read those from the bottom. So there were 14,000 patients in the Glenn Hughes Hospital. The survivors who worked closely with Glenn Hughes named the complex, a hospital complex near Bergen-Belsen, the largest such hospital in Europe on May 19th, 1944. They had 14,000 patients and they named it for the Brigadier Glenn Hughes because they observed how hard he was working trying to save lives. It took two weeks for the backlog of corpses to be buried in Belzen. 500 former inmates died each day for a month after the liberation. And I'm gonna go to now to the next slide. So the uh, end of the rescue, uh, 
even though May 8th, Victory in Europe Day came and went, uh, Glenn Hughes would not allow the British flag, the Union Jack to be hoisted until the last uh, hut was evacuated and they burned down each hut in turn because of the typhus as it was evacuated. And here is the, cer the ceremony at which they burned down the last hut with an effigy of Hitler on it. And there's a picture of the hospital and a sign indicating where the hospital was. Next slide. And it was a big event. <laughs> um, it was a moment that was captured in a postage stamp by Maldives, this little country off, off of Sri Lanka that commemorated the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. And you can see the top, the stamp and the bottom image, which was what the uh, stamp was copied from. And you see the effigy of Hitler. Next slide. So um, just this is um, a birth year of bells and survivors from Siget who arrived in Sweden. The Swedish Red Cross came and they took in about 7,000 of the sick survivors from Bergen-Belsen to recover in Sweden. And um, it's a microcosm. It just shows you who had any chance of really surviving the war. Just this little picture. Of course, there were people who survived from Siget where 90% of Siget's Jews were murdered in Auschwitz. There were some who survived in different circumstances and places. Um, not all of them wound up in Belzen and not everyone who survived from Siget who was in Belzen went to Sweden. But this just gives you a little picture. 174 people from Siget did wind up going to Sweden. And of them, you could see those who were born in the 1890s, very, very few people who were around 50 years old at the time of the war had a chance of survival. And you can see same with those in their 40s. There were some in their 30s who survived. The vast majority were born around nine, in 1921, 1922, 1923. So they were in their early 20s. Uh, the yellow bars are the, um, my aunt, my aunts, symbolize my aunts who survived in Bergen-Belsen and, and 1929 is when my mother was born and I have that in red and you can see that she was one of the very youngest who made it through the entire war and got to Sweden and many died in Sweden after because they were so sick. Next slide. So here's the epilogue. I tell um, the story of what happens after just in one chapter, what Brigadier Glenn Hughes goes on to do with his experiences and his character is really on display in a lot of ways in his post-war life, because I think he was so bereft at not being able to save so many people and witnessing so many tortured, really tortured deaths in great pain that he went on to uh, one of the things he did post-war is he researched the way in which people died um, throughout, New throughout England, um, throughout the British Isles, and he wrote a report called Peace at the Last, a book on how should people should be treated at the end of their life, and he was very close with the founder of uh, the St. Christopher's Hospice, and he was inspired, really, he was one of the people who inspired the hospice movement in terms of humane treatment and palliative care. And there's my mom in the upper right. This is the first picture we have of her. Um, here she's 15 at the end of the war, just a few months later in Sweden. And you can still see the black and blue marks under her eyes and how sick she is. And slowly, the survivor said, one survivor said, show us the sun, but slowly, slowly over time, she grew into a young woman and there she is with her sister in their, in their early twenties in Sweden. And then she meets my dad and he is and he's in the white apron on the right and he was also a survivor that's him in a displaced persons camp and then there's their wedding photo and on the bottom right is my mom today and she speaks often about her experiences she speaks to school groups next slide. And this is, um, I hope this is my final picture, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about this because it. It uh, says something about character and when you are, how it's really difficult to judge in the extreme. So I'm on the right and these are four of my aunts who all survived Bergen Bells and not my mom's sister, but my father's, my father's sister is next to me in the middle. 
my Aunt Helen. And underneath on the right is my Aunt Esther. She also survived and was in Bergendals. And they were all in the same places as my mom. They were all older than her. And to the left, bottom left, you see my Aunt Ratsy. And I just want to tell you that she is the most kind and generous and loving human being. And she was very spunky. And she worked at one point in the kitchen in the Christian Stets, uh labor camp and she would smuggle out she would take her chance at the risk of her life really she smuggled out carrots and potatoes to give away to girls to give away to people who were so hungry and once she was caught and she was put in a cellar half filled with water with rats and a red x was carved into her scalp and and they had to let her out after a few days because she was a strong girl she was the only one who could really do her job of lifting heavy, heavy um, baskets of vegetables and fruit in, in um, a vegetable, I should say, in Christian set. But this same person, Ratsi, on the death march, on the death march when they were all so hungry, she stole someone's bread. And that was breaking the bread law was very serious. It was almost like killing a person. So a person who could be so kind in one circumstance could truly act out of character when they are in the extreme and fighting for their life. Next slide. And that's, so that's it. And um, if you have any questions for me that we don't get to today, you can always contact me through my website on the bottom uh, of this. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Lerner. It's, um, it's very nice to be with you again. And indeed, uh, I'm honored to have the opportunity to be a part of the program today. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, your work and, and that of the Center for Character and Social Responsibility at Boston University um, has been profoundly impactful on my career. So I want to begin uh, with a thank you uh, for, for your work. I thought that uh, we might use our time today uh, first to discuss your broader work on character and ethics and the use of biography and how that path led to this book or vice versa. Um, and then discuss uh, some of the specifics in terms of history and character uh, from all the horrors of war. Uh, and then of course, we will take questions uh, from our audience. Uh, I thought it important to begin by saying that uh, I've just concluded reading um, All the Horrors of War, and it is simultaneously a, a deeply troubling book with vivid, chilling descriptions of otherwise unfathomable depths of human evil on display. And yet amidst this, we have stories of triumph and resiliency and overwhelming acts of goodness, of love extended to family and, and to strangers. And it's the kind of story that you sort of hope never has to be written, but here we have a story that is now, I think, necessary reading. And these displays, both of, of tremendous humanity and a lack thereof, are part of teaching character. And so I thought we might begin, if you could say a little bit about your trajectory of your scholarship in the use of biography for teaching ethics and character, and how that led up to this book. So um, I think I think human lives are so uh, rich and so instructive. And I didn't obviously I didn't want to write about just anybody. My first book is about um, seven Holocaust survivors who are no relation to me. But um, I think that biographers. I mean, most of us try to write about characters that. Um, inspire us and uh, are good, are uh, trying hard to do right. And uh, I was very, I, it was very hard for me to write about my mother. It took a long time, right? I have a different relationship with her. She's my mom. I mean, think about your mother. I mean, you know them in all kinds of ways if you're their child. And, um, but I tried in doing it, I tried to really remove myself from the process and look at her as this little girl who went through these things. And I was very taken with her character. And of course, things that I was, I, 
was told growing up and taught, I mean, she had a very hard scrabble, difficult childhood. She had to work very hard and she was very unspoiled. And to this day, she's like the most unspoiled person I know. Like if I took my kids on a trip or I took her on a trip, like she would be more in awe of things and more just, she's so appreciative because she came from poverty, even though she didn't know how poor she was. And there's something about that kind of a character who had to work so hard for everything in their life and didn't expect things and appreciated, appreciates so much living in this country, for example, and appreciates having running water, that it's there's something ennobling about it and inspiring about it and refreshing. So I I really, she I was taken with her also because she was this like street smart kid. She had had a lot of work responsibility as a kid. She had to deliver orders for her butcher grandmother all around the town of Siget. And she knew at age 14, she kind of knew how to take care of herself in a, in a certain way. Like you might've seen right in, in the book and you know, when people, when one woman said to her, can you give your portion of food? I have a growing child here. Won't you help my growing child? She, she could fend for herself. And it wasn't the nicest thing, but she said, I'm a growing child here too. And I don't need, I don't have my mother here with me, but it, it's just, I would, uh, she told me a lot of stories as I was growing up that I just thought they were more compelling and interesting than what I was learning in school. And she was a really compelling, interesting character. What, and she was a teenager as she went through it. So she had that kind of perspective. Then when I began to explore exactly how she was liberated because she had fallen unconscious when after she had been beaten up and she couldn't tell me the mechanics of her rescue, I came across Glenn Hughes. And then I had to figure out who was he as a character? Was he somebody worth writing about? Was he somebody I wanted to spend time with because I spent 15 years with, you know, doing the research and writing. And he turned out to be a, a really interesting character because he went against the policies of British officialdom. He practically became a Zionist. He really was very taken with the survivors and really embraced their cause after the war. So he became, he just seemed, and I heard so many good reports about him from people who knew him. So. Well, I think it, one of the things that's important to note is um, before your book, there had not been any books or biographies of Brigadier Hugh Llewellyn Wynn Hughes. And uh, this is really the first time um, in any depth that, that his story has been brought to life. And so um, while this is certainly a, a Holocaust survivor story, um, this brings a, a different perspective uh, to, to Holocaust literature. Um, and, and Hughes himself is certainly someone who demonstrates uh, character in, in so many different ways. Um, what was your research process in, in writing about someone who heretofore really uh, did not have a, a public presence in our, our consciousness? So I, once I determined that, okay, here's this, this interesting Oscar Schindler-like in a way character and nobody had written about him, I tried to uncover, tried to find everybody who might have known him. And it was, it was kind of a crazy uh, search. Um, can you think of his daughter? How do you find someone named Hughes in the London phone book? And it might not even be her name anymore, you know? So, so I wrote to every organization he had been part of. I traveled to London a few times. I dug deep into the archives and read everything he had wrote and things written about him. And that was the research process with it with him. With my mom, it was a little different because um, I, I was lucky to have her with me and I could ask her questions and fill in the outline of her life that I had acquired as a, you know, through all the years, through the kid. Uh, I always asked her questions. So. And as you were writing this book, you mentioned, you know, you started to learn some of your mother's story as a teenager yourself. Um, and so while this book was say a 15 year process, uh, the learning process was obviously much longer. Um, how did learning about your mother's story and your father and your aunt, uh, aunts as survivors, 
How did that influence your interest in, in character and ethics as an important part of education? Well, bottom line, I think that they're all, they were ethical people. And um, so I was raised with that as being very important. And that was a word that was used frequently in my house about human beings. That person is a match, that person's good or we try to do the right thing. We don't cheat people, we, you know, we're upstanding. We, and so I think that they were wonderful role models in terms of ethics and character. And when I, I had been interested in the Holocaust because of my family history and because I was learning all these, I was reading a lot about it. And that the interest in ethics sort of helped me, it gave me a lens through which I could interpret and try to understand all the things that were happening and during that time. Of course, it's so vast, so many different things happen in so many different places, but how to give an explanation to the real, to evil. Like, yeah, there are some things that you just are evil, that you just call out evil. And is there such a thing as a brave, evil person, the people who hijacked the planes that flew into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon? Is there, you know, how do you make sense of human behavior and character? So that study helped me to help me to to understand people better. And beyond the the core protagonists of the book, there are also these these vignettes of of character and and displays of goodness. You mentioned uh, the scene, which is vividly described in the book, of of your aunt who is giving food and is is effectively tortured uh, for that. Um, to me, one of, the, one of the most poignant moments in the book is when your mother's older sister, Elizabeth, um, makes the decision that uh, once your, your mother has first been, been uh, deemed ready for death at, at Auschwitz, that she joins her, uh, that she switches place with someone else uh, so that if they are to die, they'll die together. Um, th you know, that's a moment, really, uh, a very poignant moment of, of courage and goodness in, in otherwise uh, face of, of evil. And you see this through, throughout the book. Um, you know, these all, do you, do you see these as examples of, of character that, from which we can learn? Absolutely. I mean, you hit on probably one of the most important and significant existential moments that I describe in the book. When my aunt, who is, it looks like she has a chance to live and to, was picked to maybe be in slave labor. And my mom is picked to die in the gas chamber. And my aunt actually sacrifices herself to be with my mother. That moment says everything about my aunt. I mean, it just says everything. And when and when my mom, who was feeling sorry for herself and crying and pleading with her and saying, you're leaving me to die by myself. And my aunt makes that switch. And by the way, these kinds of things were happening all the time in Auschwitz. They, whether um, abandoning or staying, we're going to die together or all kinds of things like that were happening. When my aunt made that, that moment, that moment was, I think, transformed their relationship forever and ever. I mean, after that, my mom did whatever she could to sacrifice and try to help my aunt survive. If she was able to get a bit of food, she shared it always with my aunt. Whatever, yeah, she, they survived for each other. They survived in partnership. And even at the very end of the war in Bergen-Belsen, when they couldn't find each other, when they finally found each other, they were each other's reason for living. It was a very powerful relationship and that continued the rest of their lives. Um, as you were researching this book, were there surprises in, the, in terms of the history um, while you had studied the Holocaust and, and these various different scenarios that had occurred? Was there something that, uh, that stuck out to you? Um, for me, I'll just give one example. The, the length of the, the liberation and all of the, the horrors that occurred after the British arrived um, you know, it is not something, and you mentioned this briefly in your talk, uh, whereas you might in a very sanitized version of history think about, uh, you know, cheers and, and you know, flags being flown and, and such. Um, this was, this was um, as messy and, and as horrible as, as any other part of the experience. 
Yes, that's why I said like my mother being beaten up after the liberation. I mean, you would think, okay, there's order now, the liberators are here. It didn't happen that way. There were a lot of things I learned. I don't know if they were surprises or things I just learned in researching and writing the book. I had not been, I knew some about the Holocaust. I knew about, there's always more to learn, but I knew the rough you know, contours of what happened, but I didn't know little things like that when they brought the Hungarian gendarmes into Siget to evacuate the people, they brought in people from a different distant town because they didn't want any personal relationships. I didn't, you know, little things. And I certainly did not know what the British Second Army, what the allies were going through to get to this place. Um, so there was a lot, of, a lot of things I discovered. And then I discovered things about my mom's personal history that I hadn't quite realized. Well, she told me these stories as a kid or as a young adult, I didn't realize until I started writing about her how difficult it was, how really poor she was as a kid and how her family struggled. And then how hard it was to come back to life in Sweden. And it took really 10 years after the war. Uh, I, one more question then we'll, we'll turn to the audience. From a historical perspective, um, one of the other parts that, that struck me is, uh, as you mentioned, the, the Hungarian Jews were uh, sort of the last in, in, in Europe and, and then survived until the last year of the war, um, not unaffected, but, but certainly not as those in Poland and other places were. And there's a scene where your mother and her family are preparing for deportation and, and they seem not to understand what lays ahead of them. Um, they're, they're gathering their belongings, not as if they're going, you know, just uh, on holiday, but, uh, you know, they're gathering goose fat and large sacks of material and, um, you know, very starkly, the reality is, is laid before them as they're brought out in the street. But I, I'm interested to know if there's any understanding of, of how they had this misperception of what, how they were deceived in terms of what lay ahead of them, even that far into the war. There were no newspapers, there was no television, there was no, and, and they, um, there was a lot of hope, like they hoped that the war would be over. They heard rumblings of things. Certainly my grandfather, my mom's dad knew he had been out in the war, but there was still hope that they were, there were rumors about being resettled. There were rumors about being, uh, having to go somewhere to do labor. And, um, it was just great deception. It was so much deception that we know even, you know, when they got to Auschwitz, it was just shock. I mean, they didn't even know until they were in the gas chamber. My, my grandfather had an idea when the, he saw out the cattle train window that they crossed the border uh, into Poland. He and they were transferring the, the cattle trains from the Hungarian gendarmes to the SS. He had an idea. Um, and at that point, he, he turned to my mother and he said, I have confidence in you. You're a strong girl and you're going to make it. And I think that his words really was, if you can give a, a gift to a child, that's it, that's it. You give them, you have nothing to give them, but your words and the, his confidence in her really sustained her. Even at the end of the war, when she when the words came back to her and she was fighting and struggling to survive, but they had no idea. They had they didn't know what was what was in store. Um, turning now to some of uh, the questions from our audience um, during the liberation, uh, obviously uh, the the British were in the lead. Uh, do you know who else was present uh, during the liberation uh, besides the British? The Canadians, there were Canadian officers, there were Americans who came later. Um, they had liberated other places. They were more in the south of Germany. It depends from where they were coming. The Russians obviously liberated Auschwitz. They came from the east, they liberated Nadonik. So it depended on the on where the they were engaged in battle, where that was taking them. Uh, one of the things uh, that you, you note in the book and then in a subsequent article, uh, you know, there was a, a dearth of supplies here uh, to able to effectively treat the, the tens of thousands of people. And uh, a bit of a parallel in some ways to uh, our present public health situation, 
they actually called in um, medical school students, uh, ungraduated students from London, some hundred or so, to, to come uh, assist uh, in this crisis, um, which shows, I think, some of the logistical elements that uh, Glenn Hughes had to deal with beyond just the actual treatment. It was a logistical nightmare. It was really, uh, they were totally unprepared for it. They were engaged in battle. They were treating wounded, wounded soldiers. He had no extra units to send. So it was really, uh, really a challenge to get help in. It, three days after the liberation, there was 55 to 60,000 people in the camp and they got in only 360 medical personnel. So it was hard. Uh, in your research uh, about Glenn Hughes, um, were you actually able to uh, speak with anyone in his family as part of your research? Yes, I, I had extensive conversations with his daughter. I visited her home and I spoke with his son and corresponded with him before he, he died soon after. I, this was in 2004. And then I, subsequently later on, I met his grandchildren. So I did meet members of his family. His daughter was had, had uh, lots of his materials and was very forthcoming. Um, in terms of your own family connection, have you uh, been able to return to uh, Signet and uh, yeah. have you traveled with your mother? No, I didn't travel with my mother. I traveled uh, for the, for, there was um, uh, a trip so, someone organized for the 75th anniversary of the deportation. So I traveled with about 30 other descendants of survivors. There were no survivors on our trip. Alicia Wiesel, Ellie Wiesel's son came on that trip and we, we went to Signet and we saw it was obviously very changed. I mean, it's not even the street names are the same because now it was, it's under Romanian government and where it was prior, the borders kept changing. And um, yeah, it was really interesting to be there and to see the sites that my mom saw and to see the buildings she had been in and try to trace where she lived. Uh, one of our audience members uh, named Peter notes that his brother Mark was born at Glen Hughes Hospital in January of 1948, and that his parents had been liberated uh, on April 15th, wow. um, What are some of the, the takeaways that, that you hope people have uh, from this book? Um, as we've noted, it, it is quite different than, than other books in Holocaust literature in that it's intertwining two different stories. Um, what, what's your hope for people as they read all the horrors of war? I, I hope that they regard anyone that they meet as a sacred human being, every, every person that they encounter. Because I think that was my takeaway when I was uh, following Glenn Hughes as he came into the camp and how he was moved by seeing the individual sufferer and he didn't regard them whereas other people came in and they saw these skeletal beings and emaciated and thought they and were so this isn't the right words but like turned off they were sickened by these people they smelled and and they were so strange and they were it was easy to see why the Nazis saw them as the other so easily dispensable. They could just shoot people randomly. But Glenn Hughes didn't see them as stranger, not to regard the stranger as a stranger. Every person is a human being worthy of dignity, you know, your, your respect for them. One of Glenn Hughes' uh, legacies uh, beyond the liberation, um, certainly as important as that is, is that he was one of the first people to testify at an international trial. Um, could you speak a little bit to his role in the uh, Belsen trials? Yeah, so he was the, the Belsen trial immediately preceded the Nuremberg trials. So it was the first inter war crimes trial to invoke international law and he was the first witness at it. So in a way he set the tone. He definitely set the tone for the Belsen trial. Um, he refused to sit down. That was part of his, you know, sort of respecting the martyrs and the victims. And he stood for like two days, just giving testimony, just straight up what he saw, what he observed. And it was very important for setting the tone of the trial. 
there's another powerful part of, of this, the scene looking at the, the trials where uh, some of the others, uh, liberators who were there um, are able to, to testify. And um, while the, the perpetrators were, were given uh, due process, they were represented by, by Brits. Um, th there's a, a powerful scene where there's a, a dentist who says, if you're able to take the, the hearsay uh, of these perpetrators, why won't you listen to my descriptions? Uh, because there was this, this moment where you know, very difficult to hear, certainly to experience, to read about. Um, and this was a trial that really exposed, if you will, all the horrors of war. So she was, um, she was Ada, uh, her name was Ada and her, uh, her married name became Hadassah Rosensaft and she was the first person to give Glenn Hughes a tour of the camp. She was in relatively okay shape at the end of the war. She ran a, a barracks where she kept some children alive and through storytelling, through compassion and he was very taken with her and he convinced her to testify. And what happened during her testimony was just awful because some of the SS guards were laughing at her. They had to, the judge had to call for order in the court. It was written about in newspapers. It was, it was really shameful, but she was a, a really heroic character uh, also. There are, as I mentioned before, I, these vignettes of, uh, if you will, profiles and in, in courage uh, demonstrated uh, not only by the protagonists, but by these other figures that we meet um, in the book. And one of the things we learn also through your, the story you tell about your aunt is this is, this is complicated um, when people are faced with uh, these very difficult life-threatening uh, situations. But one of the things we, we look at in character education, I think, is that we want to study people um, in, in their glory and in their warts. <laughs> And uh, this is one of the reasons that character education can be powerful and effective, particularly for adolescents, um, that we're not just looking at exemplars and luminaries, but, but ordinary people um, who, have, who have done good and, and not so well. Um, and I think this book really helps to, to lay some of that out for us in a very powerful and vivid way. Yes, thank you. Yeah, as far as adolescence, my mom speaks a lot to adolescence, which is so good because she was an adolescent going through it. So what she can really, they relate to her. And she always tells them that they should not be bystanders. They should stand up when they see anything wrong that happens, that the Holocaust happened. And if anyone denies it, you should really set them straight. And she also tells them to use their education to do good in the world, so. I think of uh, the Edmund Burke piece that says that the, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Yeah. And we have very powerful examples here of, of good people, men and women, uh, using their wisdom and having a sense of, of justice here. And so um, certainly appreciate and, and uh, highly recommend uh, this story to to all of the members of our audience. Uh, as I say, it is it is necessary reading uh, for all of us. And so, for my part, uh, I really again want to thank you for uh, your work uh, for this book and for the role uh, that you've played in in bringing character and ethics education to to people of all ages. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you both uh, so much. Um, Bernice, thank you for sharing the story with us today and through your book. Um, I also wanna thank your mother um, for sharing her story. And um, we're so glad to hear that she um, has lived a rich life and has raised um, a wonderful daughter um, and a woman of strength. Um, so please uh, give her our thanks as well. Um, 
thank you to uh, Ryan Woods and to all of you in our audience for joining us today. Um, I do want to let you know, uh, as some people have asked, that if you're interested in um, purchasing Bernice books, um, All the Horrors of War, uh, the publisher is offering a 30% discount to attendees of this event. So you can go to John Hopkins University Press um, website and use the code HTWN at checkout to receive the discount. Um, we will be sending you a follow-up email after this program and we'll include that information in there as well. Um, I'd also like to mention before we leave two um, terrific upcoming events that the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center is offering in March. Uh, on March 2nd, next week, we launch a course on early American Jewish history entitled Freedoms and Challenges, America's Earliest Jewish Communities, 1650 to 1840, taught by scholar Ellen Smith, who is Professor Emerita at Brandeis University. On March 11th, we are co-sponsoring um, a program on the Jewish Arts Collaborative's Kitchen Exploration Series which features uh, Chef Michael Leviton uh, discussing and demonstrating uh, Passover rec recipes taken from the Jewish Heritage Center's archives. Uh, you can find more information and registration for these and other events on our website. Um, once again, thank you to Bernice Lerner and Ryan Woods and all of you in our audience for joining us today. Uh, after this webinar, you will be asked to take a brief survey about the program, and we always appreciate your taking the time to um, fill it out and to give us feedback um, and help us develop further programming. Um, and we will also be sending you um, a link to this uh, program af um, afterwards in case you'd like to watch parts of it again or share it. Uh, I invite you to learn more about the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center on our website, jewishheritagecenter.org. And I do want to mention that this free webinar was made possible by contributions to the Jewish Heritage Center and uh, New England Historic Genealogical Society from people all over the world. Um, please consider making a donation of your own to help us continue offering more free programs like this one. We hope you'll join us again for our March programs. And until then, we wish you good health and uh, a lovely evening. Thanks for joining us.